farm in the Ellen Valley, so I'm a farmer's wife, and being very interested in wildlife farming and sort of telling you a bit about history. Um, I started to do a little bit for a, um, a group called the Nature Friendly Farming Network, so promoting the good stuff that farming can do for wildlife and for the environment, being as farming does have, can have negative impacts on you know, climate change and different things. It's, uh, it also has a key for unlocking really good um, potential as well. So in hill farms in the Yellow Valley, there's an awful lot of wildlife up there. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at at the minute, which is why I've sort of come down doing this talk with you today. So it's been an excuse to dust off some of the old bones that have been sitting around the place. Um, Simon the polecat's come, he used to come to many of my events. <laughs> um, so yeah, so really just having a little look about um, the bones. So this is a picture of a roe deer um, that was taken at from Buckman Lake um, in Radnorshire. So the other thing I do as well is I'm the county recorder for mammals in Radnorshire. So if you do get any interesting mammals in the garden, I'm always keen to get um, records of those because um, birds, people tend to do a lot of bird watching, insects get a good covering, but our mammals are a little bit more elusive, they tend to be scurrying past, and people usually don't take the time to, to send a record in. So um, the other thing is some of these bones would have come from people that have found a bone and wanted to know what it was, and that's so it's become a county mammal record, record which fills up the um, picture of where mammals are in the county. So, Definitely, you can get through me through the Wildlife Trust uh, and probably on the social media and stuff that uh, you can drop messages down. So I'm happy to look at bones. So this was one picture I was sent maybe only a month ago, and the gentleman that found it, bless him, he did go back this weekend knowing that I had this with you lot, that um, to see if he could find you that roe deer skull to add to my collection too. <laughs> but he went back and obviously there are a lot of people picking up little prizes in the countryside. Not everybody's cup of tea because when I came down around the door last night to my daughter and I said, hello, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't completely, oh God, mum, not again, you know. Um, but uh, yeah. I don't know, I think it comes back to sort of that thing where you like collecting things on the beach and um, shells and rocks. And I think it is a bit of an innate human thing, actually, going back to the real basics. And we would have been in tribes in hats where we would have collected mementos and made them into jewellery and items of, of importance, you know. And I think the natural world gives you that, that maybe buying something from a shop doesn't really give you quite the same. Um, when you find something, it's, it's quite unique. So yeah, so he said, what is this, do you think? So um, there is a little bit of a picture of his boots to give it some scale, and um, it's, a, it's a roe deer. So there's only records for two types of deer in Radnorshire, and that is the, the roe deer and the muntjac deer. And again, round raider and flandering dog wells, um, I'm getting increased records, so that means that they are probably they are moving in, people are actually recording more, but I would say there has been an increase of roe deer in the locality. Um, so the a nice one for the start of some slides. And then, so um, just to start, just 25 slides, if I can talk forever, so let me shut up when you get too much of it. But um, So really, it was just why are bones important uh, in sort of the natural world sort of thing. So we only have to think of ourselves as humans. So obviously our bones are our skeleton. So it's the little bit that uh, we're, we have engineered that... Uh, joins everything together with muscles and um, ligaments. Um, and it's our framework that gives us strength. And the human, humans can jump, and the bones are made to take their weight off their bones, on their bones. So it does take a lot of um, real pounding over a lifetime. Um, so uh, the other thing about our bones is that it's um, bone marrow in it. You know, we always think about that, and obviously that's important in creating our blood cells, which are important in in, uh, fighting off infections and things like that as well. Um, and our bones, we do break bones, and again, things that you find in the wild, you sometimes have a little clue to what may be um, the, sort of was the result of its death, and uh, sometimes a broken bone or something might give it away. I think I've got a, a fox skull here, and I found only noticed it when I was seeing it last night. It's got a little hole in its head, 
I think it probably met the end of the gun, probably it's quite an exact hole. Um, so uh, I don't know what it is about, uh, again, human nature, but when, when you find things, I don't know, there's just a part of you wants to know why it's there and how it got there and, and uh, bones are preserved because, of course, um, a lot of us rots away quite quickly and we, any wildlife or anything that dies, um, I mean, wildlife is amazing, the beetles and the bugs all move in and they strip uh, all the, the matter off, which goes down to the soil as organic matter, we go back to the earth. But bones are a little bit more resistant, and though they do decay, it takes a lot longer, maybe a couple, depending on the climate around it, but it can take anything from maybe six or eight months to two years for a bone to sort of work its way back into the ground. So I think one of the facts is human babies are born with 300 bones, and uh, adults we end up with 206 bones in our body. Um, and that's just because they don't, we don't lose the bones, but they start to fuse together. So if you think of a baby's skull, again, adaptations for where um, you know, a baby is born and has to come out and the birth canal and it has those bones in its brain that are soft at the time and they're able to shape until it gets out into the world. Also, it allows it time for its brain to, um, to grow and then they fuse together and form the skull and you can see those little lines and stuff on the skull. Another bone I've got here, sort of on skull, on, um, on skulls. I don't know if anybody recognises rather vacant. It's quite one of the ones you probably find the most about in the countryside, anyway. Badger? Yeah, it's a badger bone. So um, you, can, you can tell it's a badger because it's a particularly well um, preserved one because they do tend to sort of lose their lower jaws. But um, it's got this sort of quite large no nose cavity, and as you know, badgers are quite well adapted to um, sniffing and finding worms and the ground. Um, so their smell and sense is great. But they also have, what none of the other bones have, well, some of them are cells, will have a bit of it. But you can see there's this crest at the top, and this is called the sagittal crest, and this gives it um, sort of strength in its head. So very often when a badger is hit by a car, um, I've heard other stories of badgers like a couple of hours later they'll sort of get up and struggle off the road, you know, because they can take an impact of a car coming at them because of the strength and impact of this. Usually it's the second car that kills the badger on the gliding on the road. But they, you know, it just gives you a, a sort of a feeling of how strong these bones can be. Uh, they also have a, a locked jaw, so that's what some of the dog breeds have, so you know they, they Sticks on them, and there's no need, you know, they have they have to sort of point down, for example, it's still locked into the actual upper skull cavity. And then the other thing that give it a clue that it was probably going to be something that's that's carnivore is the fact that it does have those pin and teeth, you know, and we've got what well, extended against is there's going to be meaning those teeth for ripping things apart as well. And then the molars that we've got in our own teeth that we use chewing things up as well. So that is our, our badger skull. Um, so the smallest bone in the body is in the ear. And there's a rather random bone on its own uh, at the base of the tongue. Um, and I said about that. Uh, more than half the bones are actually in your hands and your feet, which makes sense when you start to think the digits and the little tiny bones that make those up. Um, and in the sort of whole scale of the world, Having a skeleton, you know, you think all the people on this earth, isn't really um, that big a thing because most of our um, animals are actually invertebrates and things, and then so they've got an exoskeleton, so they do it differently. They put all their protection on the outside, and all their squishy organs are on the inside. And so we've got the strength and the ability and maneuverability, but of course, then we are quite vulnerable because the thing that holds us all together on the outside is is our skin, which is, again, a, a, another organ. So it's just, um, just puts us into perspective of um, how things have evolved um, on the planet, really. Um, so for me, like I said a bit to you, is finding bones is just, it's like doing some like um, uh, detective work, really. And what's about something you may not have known, you might have come across something, what's this, and you just get them got hair in the area, or you didn't know there was badgers nearby, but you found the bones. So it's nice to sort of look for those clues. Um, again, that's another sheep skull, a different one. 
So um, our animal and human bone is the same. And really to say that, I would have to say yes, we're pretty familiar. Um, so I've got a picture of a bat skeleton, which is one of my favourites. I do have a bat skeleton somewhere, but I couldn't find it in all the, all the palaver. But, um, so I put up this photo for you. And you can see the elongated bones there on the end, which are actually its hands. So it's just the way that they have evolved. And of course, between those fingers, which you can actually see, so you've got one, two, three, four, five. That one's the thumb. And often they stick out if you've got a bat in the hand. And there is a little bat there in the box as well. Um, so they've got a thumb like us that they use for holding on uh, for a little bit of grip. And then the rest of the digits are their fingers. And as they've evolved, they've formed um, the skin membrane over the uh, fingers, the little uh, digits, and that's given them the ability to fly. So that's again how the skeleton adaptation can work for different uh, mammals. Interestingly, with bats, there's about 16 species of bats in the UK. Uh, I'm licensed to hold bats and monitor bats, so I spend a lot of time with them in hand. And a lot of people don't like bats because they just think they're like little mice on wings. But until you've got a bat in the hand, you can't actually really appreciate what a wonderful mammal they are. And of course, just like us, you know, they have they do one pot a year, and they um, they feed their young milk. Covered in hair, so it's a typical sort of mammal uh, in every way, really. And um, to actually know different bats, they either do recording of them when they're shouting for their food, when they're echolocating, and that can help you know what species you have. And when you have them in the hand, you're looking for different things with them, so um, particularly bones. There was one, there was a species of bats called a brass. Um, whiskered bats and they used to blend them together they used to be called whiskered brats because people wouldn't know um, how to differentiate them because they were so similar uh, even in their calls but now they discovered that if you look really close to them in the cut on one of their molars they have a little cusp a tiny little um, sort of dent on the top that goes over on one of them and it tells you to one or the other so you're never going to know a real whiskered brat if you have it in hand and uh, the only other way, um, which isn't very modest for them, but if you have a, a little boy bat, you shape a little bit differently than the other boy bat. <laughs> and that's the way. You never thought you'd go away knowing that today. <laughs> um, but, uh, so yeah, so, and these bones and mammals are very exciting. Of course, not just mammals that have bones. So, um, and the reason we're looking at bones, once you start to look, pick a bone up and you find one, you have no clue where you're looking. There are those clues there. I mean, when we starting to look at things like, you know, the eye sockets, the size of bones, um, looking at the sort of teeth, there are really big clues um, to what it's eating and how it's eating. So the teeth of a carnivore would be very different from the teeth of a herbivore. And you go back to sort of uh, this rather handsome fella. Uh, he's adaptive. I mean, he's just a domesticated sheep. But he's got quite thin eye orbits. So when he's brain down on the ground, he's able actually to see everything around him, which is an adaptation to um, looking for predators, which is, you know, he uh, want to be on the food chain for wolves and, and other animals. Um, being a tough, he's also developed great big horns, which means important. Um, when you're farming, you realise how important they are. So if they don't grow right, they can end up killing the sheep because they'll grow maybe into the space or and uh, the better and bigger and more impressive, you want to be able to be top of the, the ranking order in sheep, and that goes for goats, and then that goes for um, uh, other mammals that, uh, that are fighting, deer is another thing you think of. Uh, we are thinking about having those sort of things. Um, so it, it can give you clues to how something is fitting into that environment, as well as the habitat that you find it. So back to the question, are our bones very different? Uh, this is a picture of some bones that we did uh, dug up um, in, I think it was France, and uh, it caused quite a lot of uh, controversy because at first they didn't know what it was, um, and uh, I don't know, but to uh, every intents and purposes, it was a human leg with a foot. And then when uh, all the scientists had a look at it, it they discovered it was actually a black bear. 
So it just shows you that you could have easily thought that was an Alexander or man that had been dug up, but actually it was uh, a black bear. So they're pretty similar. Um, some people do specialise in getting and uh, knowing what those are. So our bones are very strong, but our teeth are even stronger. So um, of course teeth are covered with a layer of enamel, which again strengthens them. And uh, yeah, it protects the nerves and the tissue into the gums. Um, and those teeth are really what gives you the clue about the animal lifestyle. So we go back and again, when you get your hands on the skulls and things, you can, you can start to see what they might be. Um, and you, you'll be looking at those clues. So we've got the sheep. Um, not particularly got very pretty teeth, but um, yeah, I suppose they, they are quite pretty from above. Uh, but uh, so they're used. We've got, he's missing his front teeth. And his front teeth are like little tiny, like arrows. Um, in fine and they will be nibbling at the grass, and uh, that's why she barks, mm -hmm. nibbling at any intent of the word. And then he will be great with more than his back to grind up all the grass and eat it, and then he will swallow it. So that, that's obviously his diet, and that those are the clues to a sheep. And then back to our badger skull, which is sort of kicked on really. The sheep got our canines, uh, obviously, uh, you know, mainly through the diet of worms. And then they cough it up. So it's really 
with the reality. <laughs> Before you like buy it, feel free. <laughs> but I've used it a lot. Um, it's a really useful tool. So I don't know, maybe about 15 years ago, I did collect loads of our pellets um, from both the valleys and stuff to give me an idea of what the upland population of barn owls are eating, uh, which gives you an idea that you know, in the whole time barn owl nest, there's a lot of stuff for it to eat. So it gives you an idea that the habitat is really pretty good. Uh, yeah, and then you find the odd interesting thing in it, like a water bowl, um, skull, or sometimes uh, frogs, it's different things turn up blackbird. In fact, uh, there's a couple of black bat skulls. They're obviously feeding on a few bats as they were flying around as well. Uh, it's just a nice way of, um, of sort of, again, connecting through the natural world. It's a bit fiddly, because generally you have a, a proper sort of pellet and uh, you would break it down with a bit of water and then you would pull the bones that are of interest out. And then the real clue is looking and there's, there's a few little um, charts there you can look at, uh, which show you the shape of the bones on the teeth, particularly to tell you if you've got a bone or a mouse. Um, and then you can use that of shrew. The shrew have got pretty um, interesting teeth and I think there's some of those there. So we have three shrews here in in mainland UK, and that's the pygmy shrew, the common shrew, and the water shrew. Uh, all of those you'll find in this locality. Water shrew are probably less recorded, uh, but they have these little red tips on their teeth, um, and they're quite pointy teeth, and of course they're insectivores, so they're chasing around looking for insects, so they need, you know, teeth that will sort of nibble and break up. Um, and that little red bit on their teeth is um, an iron deposit that is on the teeth. And in fact, the ancient Egyptians used to use um, shrew saliva to put on the end of their spears and things because it's actually um, got a poisonous quality. So I suppose we bite down uh, some of the things in the natural world do that cause like, infections and stuff like that. And it actually helps in the whole breaking down and digesting. That's the saliva. And then they've got these tiny little teeth and they've got to keep feeding, so they've got to make at least their, maybe their body weight in food a day. So, you know, they've got, that's why shrews are all long the go, because they can't afford to be lazy, because they don't get their dinner, they're not going to make it. And they tend to live maybe, you know, nine months a year, maybe a little bit longer if they're doing fine. So they're interesting. We've got a number of fat skulls. They're in like little tiny jars on these little matchsticks, because they're so delicate. So you can, you know, with the little, um, lenses, you'll be able to have a nice good look at those. Um, so yeah, so I think that's it. I've got um, a number, you can have a look at it at the minute, but um, these are the, the charts you're interested in the bones. So these are your owls. So along the owl coast, you get around the area are tawny and um, barn owls. So you've got tawny owl's wings. And I throw him in because He's got a pretty, I don't have a tawny owl skull at me, I thought I had one somewhere, but it's a big round skull. You can imagine it's being an owl, and they've also got really big sockets for these eyes, because they need big eyes, because they're letting as much light into them, so that they can see prey on the ground, and they can see the world better at night, which is the time that they're generally hunting in. But that's those big eyes, you know, that saying as wise as an owl, well, it's really sad to have to tell you this, if you believe this, but they're pretty thick <laughs> because they've got these huge orbits but not a lot of brain space in there really as an adaptation goes. Um, and then sometimes, like I've seen animals on, on occasions maybe you have when you're driving and they're on the road and their lights hit them and they just get blinded because they're just absorbed in all that light and that's often what kills, kills owls on the roadside. And then um, they've adapted with these lovely big wings that when they're flapping they're silent. So not you can hear them coming. And then there is somewhere there, you can put on the owl's foot, which has got a great big claw on the end, which is great for grabbing home things. All this is sort of slightly related.